Belgium is right at the heart of Europe, surrounded by the Netherlands, Germany, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, France and the North Sea. The country has recently undergone an institutional process of federalization, which has divided powers between the federal state, three communities and three regions. Wallonia is one of these regions. It covers half of Belgium, 30% of the population live there, and two languages are spoken, French and German. The Industrial Revolution in the 19th century gave rise to major industrial development, particularly in the province of Enu. There were few natural waterways in the area, and so much work was done to create a large network of canals. The Canal du Centre, which runs through the province of Enu, spans the 24 kilometers between Mons and Seneuf, and is the main waterway connecting France, the port of Antwerp, the Netherlands and Germany. Work on the canal began in 1882 and was completed in 1917, creating a link between the Esco and Meuse basins. Traditionally, locks were used to enable boats to cross higher ground. But in the case of the Canal du Centre, engineers were faced with two significant hurdles. First, there was very little water available, and second, there was a huge difference in the level of ground between Mons and La Louvière, a drop of more than 89 meters over 21 kilometers. After a 13 kilometer long gentle slope, there was a seven-kilometer stretch between the two towns, which went down very sharply. Just how does one deal with a 68-meter drop in ground level without using too much water? For the engineers in 1880, it was simple. A lock would need too much water, so the boats will just have to use a lift. The barge gets ready to descend the 68 meters which separate it from the top of the ridge. Four hydraulic lifts will take it down to this level. But how do these lifts work? The hydraulic lifts, which were a completely revolutionary concept at the time, use energy generated from pressurized water and are completely self-contained. Each one comprises two large containers full of water. Each of the two containers is attached to a piston in a cylinder. The two cylinders are joined by a pipe, in the middle of which is a central valve which can be opened and closed. Opening the valve creates the link between the right and left cylinders. Under the pressure of the heavier of the two containers, the water goes through the pipe into the other cylinder and the left piston is pushed upwards. The force of the surplus 30 centimeters, or 70 tons of water, then pushes the right piston slowly down. A hydraulic lift works very much like a pair of scales. If the right-hand pan is heavier, it goes down, and this makes the left-hand pan go up. Applying this principle to the hydraulic lift, a 300-ton barge can descend 17 meters in a matter of minutes, using only 70 meter cubed of water. In fact, what happens is that the container which goes up stops 30 centimetres lower than the upper reach of the canal. In so doing, when the gates are opened, water from the canal goes into the container. The level of the container goes up 30 centimetres, making it approximately 70 tonnes heavier. This extra weight makes the left-hand container the heavier of the two, which makes it go down, raising up the right-hand container at the same time. Once it has gone down, it needs to get rid of its 70 tonnes of excess water so that it can, in turn, be lifted up by the other container. To achieve this, the container that is going down stops 30 centimetres above the level of the canal. When the gate is opened, the surplus water simply runs into the canal. No energy source other than this 70 tonnes of water is required to make this system work. 
When the container completes its ascent, the lift operator has to ensure that the link between the container and the canal is watertight. Only when he has attached the canal and container gates can he proceed to open the gates. The boat will soon be able to move on, but cannot use its own motor, as the vibrations might destabilize the structure of the lift. To deal with a similar drop, a lock would have to use 3,500 meter cubed of water. That's 50 times as much as this lift system. Once the barge is out of the container, it travels a short distance before having to descend another drop of 17 meters in the same way. All the other functions of the lift, such as the raising of the gates, are also performed using the force of water. The energy needed for this is produced in the nearby machine room. In this room, there are two turbines, rather like paddle wheels, which are fed by water which comes from the upper section of the canal. When the valve is open, water flows into the turbine, causing it to rotate. In fact, the water comes from right up at the top of the lift, and is taken down 34 meters through a large pipe, nearly a meter in diameter. Valves are used to direct the water into one or other of the turbines. The water which is used to turn the turbines is then sent back into the canal via a small aqueduct just opposite the machine room. The connecting rod transforms the turbine's rotating movement into a straight horizontal one. And it is this rod which causes the pistons to move back and forth. When it rises, the piston takes in the water, and on the way back, it compresses it to 50 bars, or 50 kilograms per centimeter squared. And it is this extremely high pressure which makes it possible to raise the gates. A pressure accumulator was put in place between the turbine and the gate raising system so that the machine would not have to be in constant operation. As the turbine compresses the water, 80 tons of water at the top of a vertical piston is forced upwards. And this is how the gates are raised. A pipe brings the pressurized water into a horizontal cylinder out of which comes another piston. The cables attached to the gates run round large pulleys on the end of the piston. When the high pressure valve is opened, the gate is raised slightly by the cable attached to the white pulley in the middle of the gate. What happens is that the high pressure forces the piston out of the cylinder. This force is then transmitted to the cables by means of the pulleys. And as the gate is attached to the cables, it is raised upwards. At the same time, of course, the accumulator falls in its tower. A wedge is then put in place to secure the gate so that the boat does not have to pass under a 25-ton gate hanging from a single cable. Once this is in place, the pressure can be decreased and the cable goes slack. Boats can then enter or leave in safety. To shut the gate, it has to be lifted up slightly so that the wedge can be removed, then lowered again. Now, the weight of the gate forces the piston back into the cylinder. And at the same time, the water which was used to create the pressure to raise the gate is sent back into the canal.
There are a number of other interesting features on the seven kilometre stretch of canal, apart from the four lifts and the machine room. Two lift bridges, which were placed on straight stretches of the canal, where visibility is good. With these, only one barge can go through at a time. There are two manually operated swing bridges, which were built in bends in the canal, or where visibility is restricted, enabling two barges to go through at the same time. And last of all, four fixed bridges, all constructed in metal, seven gatehouses, houses for the canal workers, and a siphon. The countryside surrounding the canal is like an oasis in the middle of the industrial development at the heart of Wallonia. Every year, tens of thousands are drawn to the canal to experience the lift system for themselves from one of the many boats laid on for visitors. And at the same time, they discover the rich natural surroundings, the fascinating history and the technical innovation. Every Sunday, there are excursions along the canal on a boat pulled by a cart horse. Oh. We are now going upstream on a journey along the canal which takes us from the bottom to the top. After the Thieu lock and the old cement works, we come to lift number four, the last in the series. Then, after a long stretch where the canal is completely straight, there is the Morage lift bridge. A little further on, one comes to the old lift bridge at the local railway line, which was destroyed during the strikes in 1960. Then there is another long straight stretch of canal, after which we come to the Brecagny lift bridge and pedestrian footbridge right in the centre of the village. Most of the people who go on excursions along the Canal du Centre take the boat from here. There is the new fast road, linking Barge to the main motorway through Wallonia. Here, between two blind bends, is the swing bridge at Strepi, and immediately afterwards you can see the third lift, with the machine room and the two towers which house the accumulators. 400 metres further on, we come to the second lift, The canal was taken right through the village of oudan emery with the swing bridge right in the middle of what was once the main church square. At this point, we are at the 105 metre mark, 105 metres above sea level. The canal is higher than the surrounding houses here. It was in fact built in an embankment. Now, we can see the pillars of the old 100 metre bridge, which linked the colliery at Bois du Luc to the Oudan Junction. And there's the Red Bridge, where the old ecosine Herculine Railway crossed over the canal. Now we come to the Capite Bridge, an old swing bridge which was turned into a fixed bridge in 1932 on account of the volume of traffic on the main road linking Le Roux and La Louvière. On the left now is the Italian barracks built in 1946. This building was used to house hundreds of Italian immigrants who came to the region to work in the various industries. Now the building has been turned into a visitor's centre for people coming to see the canal. And finally we come to lift number one, which brings us to the high highest point of all the Belgian waterways, 121 metres above sea level. On the right, you can see the Gustave Boel factories. These, along with other industries, were the reason why the canal was built in the first place. The area could never have been fully developed as an industrial centre without the canal. 
This canal, intended for loads of up to 300 tonnes, is too small for today's requirements. Europe-wide agreements dating back to 1950 provided for the Belgian network to take loads of up to 1,350 tonnes, and a new canal has been dug. Here are the works at Strepitieux, where a huge lift is under construction. This one lift will replace all four lifts and two locks. The 1,350 tonne boats will be taken down 74 metres in one go. Once they get to the top of the giant lift, they will continue by means of a canal bridge, which will connect up with the upper reach. In this one small area of Belgium, there is the sloping lock at Ronquière, the biggest in the world. The biggest funicular lift in the world is currently being built. And there is a 300-ton tunnel and the remains of a 70-ton tunnel dating back to 1832. And this is not to mention the four hydraulic lifts, which are all still in perfect working order and in original condition, unchanged over more than 70 years. On the 22nd of September, 1992, the four hydraulic lifts were listed by the Walloon region as a national monument, and the seven kilometers of canal on which they are to be found was declared a protected site. The surrounding area is also protected to ensure that its development is in keeping with the character of these important national treasures. This protected zone meets the standards laid down by UNESCO. So, if you go aboard a boat on the Canal du Centre and take the lift, it will be an experience you can have nowhere else in the world.